some of the detail, get into a little bit of depth, enough so that you can recognize problems when they come up. Um, but if we have to rush on and skip over a few session sections of questions, I will do with assuming it's okay with Christy, I'll do what I do when I normally give these presentations in person. I will stay after as long as people want to talk and ask me questions is fine. But I do want to try to get through as much of the material as I can by eight um, for those who do need to get off for other family commitments. Okay, so moving right along, let me uh, share my screen. And if you have copies of the slides to take notes on. I know I, I like to do that um, when I'm in sessions. Let's see. All right, uh, am I sharing my screen, folks? Yes. Okay. Everybody can see okay? All right, good. Uh, so I wanna start out with the history of special education law. Um, first of all, I, I just, I like history and um, I find it so, so many things fascinating, but especially the things that I care about. And a lot of times it makes a difference. If you understand where we came from, you understand the objectives of what we're trying to achieve now and where we can move policy along to make it even better um, for these special kids. And so, um, Let's see, we'll start out with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act of 2004. Um, this education uh, in, is, blah, blah, blah. this is an education entitlement and funding law. Um, so there's money attached to it. And it evolved out of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, this is a grant statute that attaches many strings to the federal funds that it provides states for, for school districts. Um, it has a requirement, of course, that a free and appropriate public education be provided to children with disabilities in the least restrictive environment, or LRE, appropriate for the child. So uh, many of you probably remember from school uh, hearing about the, the landmark case, Supreme Court case, Brown versus Board of Education. This was in 1954, it was decided, and the U.S. Supreme Court held, quote, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, end quote. Um, the Supreme Court found there was a denial of the equal protection of laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment by separate but equal schooling. And so the parents of kids with disability, however, of course, this is for uh, uh, children of uh, of color, uh, parents of kids who had disabilities you know, were, were paying attention. It was all in the news about this, this new uh, Supreme Court ruling. And they started thinking, well, wait a minute, if separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, then it doesn't necessarily have to do anything with, with color or class. Um, it also would have to do with disabilities. It'd have to do with our kids. Because at that time, um, schools were essentially refusing to allow children with disabilities, any disability, into the public school, or they were warehousing these kids in separate um, facilities that were highly inadequate. So after Brown v. Board of Education, parents began to sue schools for excluding children with disabilities and warehousing them. So about 10 years later, Congress passed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. Um, this was amended again in 1966 to create an actual grant program, money, <laughs> for handicapped children. And this grant program was replaced in 1970 by the Education of the Handicapped Act. The problem is neither had mandates on how schools were supposed to use this money, um, nor did either one of these um, laws show any significant improvement in the education of children with disabilities. So then in the 1970s, we had two more landmark cases in the area of special education law. Um, the first one was Park v. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in 1971. This was a class action that was brought by the Pennsylvania Association of Retarded Children. And uh, instead of there actually being a judicial decision, there was a consent agreement that was accepted and entered by the court. And in that uh, consent agreement, children with intellectual disabilities it said were entitled to a public education and could not be excluded from school without a prior hearing. So that kind of started the procedural uh, protections. 
And then in Mills, the Board of Education of the District of Columbia decided in 1972, uh, this was also a class action that was brought by parents um, because children with disabilities were regularly excluded, suspended, and expelled from public schools with no due process whatsoever. Uh, that's what the case originally was brought for. However, in um, the decision, the court held, because one of the arguments that the school district made was that they didn't have money to do these things and to take care of these kids. And the court held, and I highlighted it for you because it's so relevant, in 1972, almost 50 years ago, the court held that insufficient funds was no excuse for the schools. Um, and then in this very detailed judgment, the court sketched out the rights that would soon be afforded to parents and students under what we know as the IDEA. In the two years following these two court cases, there were an additional 36 court cases in 24 states on the right to education for all handicapped children. There were 38 court cases in 25 states on the right of these children to due process and eight court cases in six states on the right of treatment for all children who need it. In those cases, judgments were rendered in favor of disabled children. And all of this is, is cited in the congressional record um, that went along with the uh, passage of the IDEA. So good stuff. So Park and Mills opened the floodgates and a lot of good stuff was done in the courts to help kids with disabilities um, get a good education. But we weren't quite there yet. Um, so Congress did an investigation and found that at that time, 8 million disabled, there were 8 million disabled children in the U.S. 1.75 million had been excluded from school altogether. More than half of those who were in school received inappropriate educational services due either to a lack of resources to provide appropriate services, failure to diagnose disabilities, or segregation of students with disabilities in separate schools and classrooms away from their peers. Again, all of this was cited um, in the public law and the findings when IDEA was passed. And um, I have my little reference to Forrest Gump, if you guys remember that movie. Um, there just wasn't a lot that parents could do um, to get their kids who were a little different um, to, uh, to be able to stay in the public schools. Congress found that the long range implications of these statistics are that public agencies and taxpayers will spend billions of dollars over the lifetimes of these individuals to maintain such persons as dependents and in a minimally acceptable lifestyle. With proper educational services, many would be able to become productive citizens instead of being forced to remain burdens. And Congress also found, importantly, that parents of handicapped children all too frequently were not able to advocate for the rights of their children because they've been erroneously led to believe that their children will not be able to lead meaningful lives. Congress recognized that school districts were woefully underfunded to provide the services necessary to meet their legal obligations. And Senator Mathias from Maryland noted that only 40% of the 70 million 7 million children in this country with disabilities were receiving an adequate education. So in the 1974 reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, Congress authorized additional funding for programs for handicapped children and set the stage for the enactment of the IDEA. So uh, in 1975, we have the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, children Act uh, which amended the Education and Handicapped Act of 1970. This act gave children with disabilities a right to a FAPE, which is a free and appropriate public education. It substantially expanded funding on a permanent basis to ensure FAPE. Funds were to be used exclusively for excess costs in educating children with disabilities. So schools couldn't say, oh, well, we're getting all these federal dollars, we'll use the money we used to spend for kids with, with you know, taking care of kids with disabilities, we're gonna spend that on the football team or on a new high school or whatever the case may be. Um, Congress was smart and they said, no, these are for additional costs. You have to keep spending what you're spending, but this is to pay for the extra cost and doing the right thing. And they included a process for holding um, LEAs, which is local educational authorities, accountable for providing educational services to these children. In other words, they're procedural safeguards. And this law has been amended several times and it was given the name IDEA in 1990. And don't ask me why we 
all of us in the in the biz call it IDEA and not IDEA. I have no idea. It doesn't make sense to me, but that's 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 the lingo. And it was last amended in 2004. So the purposes behind the IDEA were to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them a FAPE. Um, but also, and I highlighted this part because it's super important our advocacy for kids with disabilities today. Um, the purpose of the IDEA, one of them, was uh, to emphasize special education related services designed to meet these kids' unique needs and, here's the important part, prepare them for further education, employment, and independent living. So it's not just about how do we help them sweep by school. The entire focus from pre-K on is how do we provide kids with what they need while they're in the public school system to be able to go on to further education, whether it's college, VOTEC school, whatever, employment or independent living. So every IEP meeting, I try to remind myself of this. All right, what's our end game here? Where are we going? And it's what do we need to do in this IEP to make sure that we're focused on the end game, educate further education, employment, or independent living. And then a third purpose for the IDEA was to ensure that the rights of children with disabilities and their parents are protected. So what is a FAPE? FAPE or Free Appropriate Public Education under the IDEA is, a, is special education and related services that are free without cost um, that meet state and IDEA standards. And these include preschool, elementary and secondary education and are provided pursuant to an IEP which is an individualized education plan. Yes, lots of alphabet soup in special ed. Uh, to get money, states must provide FAPE to children with disabilities between three and 21 years old, including those who are hospitalized, have been suspended or expelled, or those who are incarcerated. Um, I had a handful of cases when I was down in, in Lynchburg of, of kids who had been incarcerated and the schools were not providing a free appropriate public education to these kids in violation of the law. Um, so a lot of times it's kids falling through the cracks. Um, pretty much the schools know they're supposed to be doing this, but if no one's really keeping an eye on it, um, they're not uh, always following through. So as advocates, as CASA advocates, um, this is something to be aware of, that even kids when they're incarcerated, um, group homes, whatever the case may be, they're still entitled to a fate. All right, um, in addition to, so we had the IDEA coming down the pike and, and creating procedural safeguards and special education services, um, but coming right on the heels of that uh, was the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and in particular, the part of that we're most interested in is Section 504. Um, this Section 504 is a broad civil rights or non-discrimination law, so it's not a money law. Right? It's not a funding law. It's a non-discrimination civil rights law. A protected, provided protection for people with disabilities for the first time in U.S. history. And uh, Section 504 applies to programs receiving federal funding, which includes, of course, public schools, trade schools, colleges, universities. It can even uh, uh, cover private schools if they're receiving federal funding, say, for example, through the school lunch program. Um, that can bring them under the umbrella of Section 504. As I said, though, it's an unfunded mandate. There's no money attached to it. However, unlike IDEA, it does include an anti-retaliation provision. And there's plenty of case law out there um, to say that the retaliation can be against the parents or members of the child's family if the parents are advocating on behalf of the child. Um, this is the original text of the Section 504. There's not a whole lot to it, as you can see. Um, it, this uh, Section 504 was originally introduced in 1972 as an amendment to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, but it was not enacted. Uh, but Congress did enact this handicapped rights statute in Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. However, no implementing regulations were issued between 1973 and 1977. Remember, this is it. This is law. That's all it says. <laughs> so what schools are supposed to do with that was up for a lot of debate and pretty much they just put their heads in the sand and nothing was happening. And so for four years, we didn't get regulations um, to implement this, this law. 
and they were only issued after a lawsuit and a series of sit-ins and demonstrations by people with disabilities. And I, I, <laughs> I uh, suggest to everybody, uh, please look up this story by Kitty Cohn um, about short history of the 5-4 sit-in. It is fascinating. There were people from Cal in, in, in wheelchairs in California who were in U-Haul trucks, strapped themselves into U-Haul trucks and traveled across the country to protest on Capitol Hill to get these um, uh, regulations uh, enacted. So a uh, fascinating story of, of advocacy to, to get us where we are today. Um, these uh, specific regulations are found in 34 CFR Part 104. Um, and nobody has these books anymore. Everybody can look it up on the internet. The internet's the great uh, even upper. <laughs> so you can access this information as easily as an attorney nowadays. Uh, but uh, of all these different uh, regulations, the part we're most concerned about are those for preschool, elementary, and secondary education. Section 504 is enforced by the Office of Civil Rights, uh, what we call OCR, more alphabet soup for you, uh, that is within the US Department of Education. And OCR enforces lots of acts, um, but uh, also uh, in addition to 504, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And uh, OCR pretty much, and as do the courts, uh, interpret the regulations for 504 and the ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act uh, to be the same. So uh, I will dig much deeper into 504 and ADA, but mostly into 504, but just know and understand that um, those two laws are interpreted pretty much the same way. There are very few differences. Um, but this is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, again, the law itself is pretty short. Um, so it's the regulations that really put the meat on the bones uh, for these, these laws. President Bush signed the ADA into law in July 26, 1990. Um, it just seems like the ADA has been around forever, but it really hasn't. Um, so uh, it's a relatively new law. It's a broad, again, civil rights, non-discrimination law. It's not a money law. Um, it's not a grant program, but this law prohibits discrimination that's based on disability. It's modeled after the Civil Rights Act and 504. Again, no money, it's unfunded. It does also include an anti-retaliation clause. It has the exact same eligibility standard. In other words, to qualify for protection under this act, it's exactly the same as section 504. And the ADA was recently amended in 2008 uh, because of some terrible court decisions uh, that really limited who could qualify under the ADA and Section 504 as, as a person with a disability. And um, Congress came back and said, no, no judicial system. That is not what we meant. We did not want this to be incredibly hard and onerous for someone to prove that they qualify. Um, and so they, they turned all of that on its head. And it's relatively easy to qualify by law under these uh, two provisions, although in the trenches where we all are living and working, um, a lot of times schools are very reticent uh, to find kids uh, actually qualify under these acts and it's unfortunate and hopefully something with good advocacy we're gonna change along the way. Um, there are five titles in the Americans with Disabilities Act. The part we're interested in is Title II, uh, which covers US Department of Education and hence um, schools. Uh, the big difference uh, at this point that I want to talk about uh, between IDEA and Section 504 and the ADA are the remedies that are available um, to plaintiffs uh, that pursue uh, violations of these laws. With the IDEA, you can get prospective relief. So the court could order a finding of eligibility. They could change something in the IEP. They could change the placement um, of the child or prevent a, a change in placement from happening. Um, they can reverse a manifestation determination decision. Under IDA, you can get retrospective relief. In other words, to make up for what happened in the past, what the school did wrong. You can get what we call comp ed, compensatory education. You can get tuition reimbursement. Uh, if the, the parent uh, privately placed the child in a uh, private school while all this was going on, assuming certain requirements were met, they could get that tuition reimbursed once the decision is made by a hearing officer of the court. You can get attorney's fees and costs, but again, a very unfortunate uh, Supreme Court decision a few years back uh, basically said that we cannot get expert witness fees uh, if we prevail in an IDEA case and there are no punitive damages. These are not big money cases, all right? This is not like slip and falls or um, uh, 
car accident cases where you know, people are walking away with millions of dollars because they got burned by coffee. You know, it's just, um, that just doesn't exist for us in this area of the law, which explains a lot as to why there are probably so few attorneys who practice in this area. Um, but it's important um, that we have folks that are advocating, whether it's attorneys or advocates paid or unpaid, um, for these kids uh, because their civil rights are being violated all the time. Uh, in comparison, Section 504 and ADA, you don't get prospective relief necessarily, but you get re retrospective. You can get comp ed, you can get tuition reimbursement. What's different is you can get monetary or compensatory damages. Um, this would be lost time from work, uh, uh, transportation costs to a therapy, uh, if a, some, a special piece of equipment had to be purchased for the child uh, that, that the school should have provided, that can be reimbursed. But it's primarily reimbursement uh, for things uh, that are associated with the violation of the law. However, in order to recover monetary damages, the courts have said, well, it's not enough that they discriminated. It's got to be intentional discrimination. So they kind of raised the bar. And in the Fourth Circuit, which is where we are in Virginia, um, they have said that it requires a showing, we have to prove that the school acted either in bad faith or with gross misjudgment. So it, it's a pretty high bar to get over to get those monetary damages. Um, but uh, not only can you recover attorney fees and costs, with Section 504 and ADA claims, if you prevail on those, you can then recover your expert witness fees. But in neither case can you get punitive damages. Um, I do note here that in both cases, both law, all, well, three laws, schools can also recover litigation costs, attorney's fees and costs from the parents when the underlying action is frivolous, unreasonable, or without foundation. Um, but again, this is a pretty high bar for schools to recover from parents. The cases that are reported are very egregious, like a parent who filed due process on the exact same claims five times. Um, you know, things that it, it has to be pretty bad before a, a judge is going to order that parents pay the attorney's fees for the school district. But it's important for people to know um, you can't just throw lawsuits at the school because you don't like them and you think they're jerks. I mean, you've got to have a good solid legal basis for your claims or there could be penalties for that. All right, so now let's uh, dig down real quick. Christy, um, if you want to unmute and let me know, are there any questions so far? Um, not about what you've covered so far. There's more of a situational type question, but maybe we can hold that for a little bit later. Yeah, if we can hold the specific situational questions till the end, that would be great. Um, and you may get an answer as we go through this anyway. Um, okay, let me move along. We're now going to dig down. That was kind of the 10,000 foot view of what we were going to cover, but now I want to dig down into the actual laws themselves. So there are various sources of laws. I've talked about the IDEA, um, Section 504, the ADA, um, but we are also ruled or governed by federal regulations, uh, judicial decisions, court um, decisions, either federal or state. Um, we are governed by state regulations. In Virginia, we do have IDEA, special education regulations. However, in this state, we do not have state 504 ADA regulations, um, which is a little difficult because the federal reg regulations for Section 504 and the ADA are um, pretty thin, so uh, it makes it difficult. <laughs> um, but uh, but the, we do have regulations that cover IDEA in the state. And then, of course, there are guidance documents from federal and state departments of education. Um, the Office of Special Education Programs in the U.S. Department of Education, OSEP, Office of Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Education, uh, Virginia Department of Education, all enforce IDEA. Um, 504 and Americans with Disabilities Act. You have um, the uh, Office of Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Education. You also have the Office of Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Justice um, that will sometimes bring these cases as well. So um, lots of places that can, can produce guidance documents to help us. And at the very end of the slides, which I'm sure we won't get to, um, but I have some pictures of what the guidance documents look like if you go online and try to search and find them. 
All right, so who's protected in these laws? And I saw this Venn diagram, I think when I first started getting into special education law and it just really made it clear for me. Um, so you have in the world of all students who might have a disability, right? Um, IDEA is the most narrow. That is the hardest to qualify for because you have to have a showing that the child needs special education. Um, so that is a more narrow subset of students with disabilities. However, Section 504 and Americans with Disabilities Act is a much broader definition to be able to qualify um, for protection under those laws. And the kids who are protected under IDEA are also protected by Section 504 and Americans with Disabilities Act. So if your kid has an IEP, then they're covered by all three of these laws. If they don't have an IEP, then they may, they may just not have been properly identified, um, but they may only qualify under Section 504. For example, kids that only have a bee allergy or maybe epilepsy, then it doesn't affect um, their access to the general education curriculum in the classroom. Um, so, you know, these kinds of situations where the child has a disability, but it's not affecting them academically or in the classroom, they're able to access the classroom like any other student, they just need some extra supports they may just have a Section 504 plan. Um, but let's start out with the IDEA. Uh, that's the one that most people have heard of because uh, the, you know, if, if you have a kid with disabilities that's being serviced or provided services in the school, they probably have an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan. All right, who does the IDEA protect? Uh, by law, it protects children ages 3 through 21. However, states are allowed that the IDEA is what's called a floor. It's the minimum uh, rights that a child with disabilities would have under federal law. However, states are certainly allowed to layer on additional rights and services. Um, and so in Virginia, the decision was made to expand uh, the realm of children who are protected under IDEA in Virginia. So in Virginia, it's ages two to 22, unless that student has graduated with either a standard or advanced diploma, um, or if they're receiving early intervention services, they would do that, and then they would matriculate into the public school under IDEA. But, uh, but Virginia has expanded that protection. Uh, students have to be found eligible by a multidisciplinary team within one or more of uh, 13 specific disability categories. Uh, the student has to need special education and related services. Uh, it provides this protection to students who have been expelled or suspended from school. And it includes some children with disabilities who are incarcerated. And so uh, I mentioned that earlier. Melissa. Yes. Um, would you be able to either turn up your computer volume or get closer or project a little more? I think on my computer it's already all the way up, but I will try to project better. Hopefully that will help. Um, all right, so the IDA governing principles, first of all, child find. This is the duty of um, on the school district to identify, locate, and evaluate all children with disabilities residing in Virginia. So these are not just kids who are in, enrolled in the public school. These are kids who are in private schools. These are kids who are homeschooled. That duty extends to all children. Uh, another governing principle is parent participation. This has to be meaningful. Um, so it can't just be perfunctory. Parents have to be given a chance to participate meaningfully in what's going on with their child's education. Uh, the IDA provides, as we said, faith that meets a child's unique needs and confers an educational benefit. It has to be in the least restrictive environment or LRE to the maximum extent appropriate. So the default is what people refer to as mainstreaming, keeping kids in the general education classroom. However, there has to be a continuum of services that would go all the way to the most restrictive which would be in a self-contained classroom. So there has to be a continuum between the, those two extremes, general education with no supports at all, or a completely self-contained classroom. Uh, and then wherever it's most appropriate for that child is where the child would be placed on that continuum. These kids have to have individualized education plans 
and the IDEA provides procedural safeguards in particular for discipline. Um, if there is a suspected disability, um, there is a suspected disability if the student's having trouble. For example, low grades, problems reading or paying attention, repeated suspensions or poor behavior, or fighting in school. These are all red flags that the school should be paying attention to that maybe this is a child who needs to be um, evaluated for special education services. And a disability could be present even if the child is not failing and is passing from grade to grade. If the school suspects a disability, it must do something. It could initiate an evaluation immediately. It could refer the student to a child study committee or other school-based team to decide whether to initiate an evaluation or to begin a pre-referral intervention or um, RTI response to intervention. Um, but these are additional services that they would provide to the kid that kind of level up a little bit. However, the law is very clear that these interventions cannot be used to delay the evaluations. Unfortunately, and I'm learning up here in Northern Virginia, this is a pretty common tactic um, that they will keep uh, kids in child study for years <laughs> uh, before they actually agree to evaluate the child providing all these interventions. Um, that is actually in contradiction to what the law says. You can do it what in the process where we're waiting for evaluations to come in and for the team to establish an IEP, but this is not meant to be a delay tactic. Um, if the parent suspects a disability or if the cost of volunteers suspects a disability, um, he or she can request uh, a special education evaluation in writing. A judge can request a special education evaluation. Um, so it, it's very broad. It's not just the parent or the teacher who can request this. It's much broad, broader than that. Um, and so if there's concerns, uh, this is something that that might need to be considered. Uh, in 2007, the Supreme Court held giving parents meaningful opportunities to participate in the education of their children would ensure that the goals of IDEA are carried out. Um, part of this, this uh, goal of providing for parental participation are the parental rights that are in the IDEA. That parents have a right to participate in the development of the child's IEP to refuse consent to evaluation and services. And again, Virginia is unique from other states in that it requires consent for any change to the IEP. A lot of other states don't have that and it's, it's a problem um, because schools can change things on, the whim, on a whim without parent uh, knowledge even, much less consent. Not in Virginia. It requires consent for an IEP uh, by the parent for an IEP to be changed. Uh, parents have a quite <laughs> a right to request an independent educational evaluation or IEE. So once the school has evaluated the child, if the parent doesn't uh, agree with the evaluation, then they have the right to request this IEE. And the school has two choices. They can say, yeah, okay, or they can file due process against the parent to prove that their evaluation was appropriate and the parent is not entitled to an IEE. This is a very expensive proposition. So generally speaking, when parents know the law and that, that schools aren't allowed to just say no and walk away, um, these IEE requests are granted. I'll talk a little more detail about some, uh, uh, some IEE issues, but uh, in general, it's important to know that the school only has two responses and no is not, just a flat no is not one of those uh, legal answers. To seek relief through various dispute resolution mechanisms, including reimbursement of private school tuition. So these are parental rights. And it can be a deprivation of faith if the school imposes significant impediments to the parent's opportunity to participate. And if there's a failure to provide faith, then the parent wins. That's, that's, that's this yardstick that the courts and the hearing officers are going by. If the if school fails to provide faith, then they owe something to the child. Uh, the term parent uh, means, of course, a natural or biological or adoptive uh, parent, we, that seems obvious, but also a foster parent of a child, uh, even if the biological parent's rights have not been terminated, um, but the schools must still give notice to the parents, biological parents, at the last known address of IEP meetings and whatnot. A guardian can be a parent, but not a GAL, and the state or DSS uh, cannot be the parent if the child is a ward of the state. So for example, a foster child with no foster parent or a child in the custody of DSS. Um, an individual acting in the place of a natural or adoptive parent, such as a grandparent, step parent, et cetera, um, with whom the child lives, 
a surrogate parent, there's a whole legal process for appointing surrogate parents we don't get into, or married or emancipated minor. Uh, parents can invite anyone they want to these IEP meetings. Uh, any individual can be a part of that and attend. And at the discretion of the parent or the agency, other individuals who have knowledge or special expertise regarding the child, including related service personnel as appropriate could come. So a CASA volunteer could come to the IEP, be invited and come to the IEP meeting. Um, a physical therapist treating the child could be invited and come to the IEP meeting. So uh, it's, it's pretty broad. Um, certainly an attorney could come to the IEP meeting. Some schools do have a require release to be signed for people to participate. So evaluation. So the school, let's say the school has agreed, yep, we're going to evaluate the kid. So these evaluations have to evaluate all areas of suspected disability. Um, they can't just, you know, a child that, that has been diagnosed with ADHD, um, with depression, and with um, autism, the school can't just say, well, we're just gonna look at autism. No, if, if there's a suspic suspicion that a kid has any disability, they all need to be considered and evaluated. Schools have to get parental consent before evaluating. They have 65 business days uh, to, uh, to complete these evaluations. So uh, that's not the equivalent of two, a little over two months. It's often more like three months. And if it's around Christmas and Thanksgiving, that you know, four, you're pushing four months that the school has to be able to finish these evaluations. But the clock does tick over the summer. It's not necessarily when children are in school, it's actual business days. And schools must give copies of evaluations to the parent upon request. A lot of parents don't realize this but they're supposed to be, parents can get copies of all these evaluations at, the two, at least two business days prior to the eligibility meeting. It can be more if you request it, but the school doesn't have to do it. Um, eligibility, required members of the committee are the parents, qualified professionals, school evaluators, the special education administrator, and others. An eligibility decision must draw upon information from a variety of sources, they, we want to know, is there a disability? Does it adversely impact education? Although not all disability categories require an adverse impact. Um, what is the split between achievement and ability? Uh, look at grades, attendance, classroom functional performance. Um, do they have appropriate social skills? Do they have a, appropriate um, functional skills? Are they potty trained? Um, all of these are important questions to ask. And what special education related services are needed by the child? So here are the uh, IDEA disability categories. Uh, I, the ones that are noted with an asterisk, as I said, these do actually in the law and the regulations do not require a showing of an adverse effect on educational performance. And in particularly, I highlight specific learning disabilities, obviously very common disability category. And in fact, unless they changed it recently, even VDOE's template uh, for an eligibility determination, their checklist um, for specific learning disability unfortunately includes adverse effect, and that's not the law. Um, so anyway, so note to self for advocates, you actually don't have to make that showing. And developmental delay, IDEA says that's for ages three through nine, and again, for, but they leave it up to states to decide if you're even going to have this disability category. Um, so not all states have it, but in Virginia, actually, developmental delay is ages two through six. All right, I mentioned IEEs before, so they evaluate, they say, nope, kid isn't eligible, doesn't um, qualify for anything, and the parent absolutely knows that's crazy town. Um, they can request an independent educational evaluation, has to be conducted by a qualified examiner, not employed by the school. Um, at the very bottom corner there on the screen, I have a little sample from Lynchburg, um, but school districts do provide lists of evaluators. So when the parent says, I wanna get an IEE for speech, so the school district will often provide a printed list to the parent of evaluators who can do a speech evaluation. The problem is they usually don't do a really good job of explaining to the parent you're not limited to that list. As long as the evaluator you want meets the same qualifications as the evaluator who conducted the evaluation for the school, then you're good. Um, and schools can put other restrictions. They can put cost restrictions on it. They can put geographic um, restrictions. For example, you can't pick an evaluator who's more than 50 or 100 miles away from Lynchburg, for example. Um, but uh, you are not limited to this list of providers that the schools provide. And, and I tell people, don't be mad that they provided the list. It's a blessing. 
but just understand what it is and what it isn't. It's a blessing that now you don't have to flail around in the dark trying to find somebody to do this test for your kid. But on the other hand, you're not limited if there's someone else you'd like to use. Okay, um, let's dig in a little bit more on FAPE. What's a free appropriate public education? Uh, it is, of course, special education and related services provided pursuant to the IEP. And these have to be designed to meet the children's unique needs and prepare them for, as I said before, further education, employment, and independent living. And um, the one thing I probably should highlight on this slide is unique needs. So just because a school has a autism program, that doesn't mean that every kid with autism goes in that program because that program may not actually meet the unique needs of the specific child with autism. So um, that's the, the individualized and in IEP, the I is super important. And as advocates, we need to make sure that schools aren't just shoehorning our kids into programs they just happen to have because they have them, um, as opposed to putting them in the right program because it's what the kids need. Um, FAPE, uh, the, the definition of what that actually means, uh, was decided by the Supreme Court in 1982 in the Rowley case. Amy Rowley, she had minimal residual hearing. She was an excellent lip reader. She was fully integrated into a gen ed classroom. She made good grades. She progressed from grade to grade. However, um, it was well documented that she understood significantly less of what was going on in the classroom than her peers. So the parents wanted a sign language interpreter for her and the school only offered an FM voice amplification system. The U.S. Supreme Court rejected the parents' argument that Amy was entitled to an equal educational opportunity under IDEA. Um, that is not the standard for a free appropriate public education under IDEA, but I will note, as I did here on the slide, it is the standard under 504 and ADA, so keep that in the back of your mind. But for IDEA, IDEA purposes, um, it is not an equal educational opportunity. Uh, However, they did find there was a substantive right to a free appropriate public education, and they had a two-pronged test for this. Procedural compliance, so the schools had to comply with all the regulations for IDEA, and the IEP the school created had to be reasonably calculated to enable the child to receive educational benefits. And so, of course, what these educational benefits were and how strong or weak they were was uh, fodder for many, many court cases um, after rally. Uh, let's see, uh, the IEP had to be likely to produce progress, but not, uh, but did not need to maximize potential. In other words, schools were not obligated to provide kids with the best education. And any of those of you who've been around special, educa special education for any length of time have probably heard, no kids entitled to a Cadillac education. Um, that actually came from a case, a Sixth Circuit case in 93, Doe versus Board of Education. And the court said a school's not required to provide a child with a Cadillac education, a serviceable Chevrolet is all that the IDEA requires. And then I always like to tack on, but a Pinto isn't good enough. So <laughs> there's a third prong to this um, that I think we need as advocates to uh, keep in mind. Uh, but that was the standard. Um, kids were only entitled to a Chevy. Uh, they didn't get a Cadillac. However, the court noted in a footnote that passing from grade to grade was not automatically a FAPE, although the school districts for years um, used that as a standard. We actually had a Western District of Virginia case in 2010, DBV Bedford County, um, that really helped us on this FAPE issue. And the court there said token advancement was a sad case of social promotion. Um, the court found that the IEP failed to provide FAPE because of evidence of insufficient progress and regression. And it was a clear case that the school was just socially promoting this kid year after year. He couldn't read, um, couldn't do math. It was, it was pretty egregious. And so uh, the court said, nope, that is not, you, you can't just, you know, show minimal to no progress. And certainly if there's regression over time, then this is evidence that the school did not provide that child a FAPE. So the IEP team uh, needs to look behind the grades and use multiple sources of information to determine if progress is being made and if FAPE is actually being provided. Don't let them say, this kid has good grades. I don't need an IEP. <laughs> or that IEP is fine. He's making good grades. Um, we always have to look behind the grades. So more recently, 2017, we got a new IDEA Supreme Court case, Andrew F., um, the Douglas County School District. Um, 
Andrew had been diagnosed with autism at age two. By fourth grade, he still exhibited numerous maladaptive behaviors. This was um, a, a child that was on the low functioning end of the autism spectrum. Um, the parents privately placed the child. They didn't feel he was making progress. They privately placed him in a private school. And while there, his behaviors improved significantly and he made a lot of academic progress, much more than what he made in the public school, significantly more. So um, uh, this went through a due process hearing uh, to an ALJ, then it went to federal district court, then it went to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, pretty much in all of these, uh, uh, at all of these levels, the parents lost. Uh, the court said the instruction and services furnished to children with disabilities must be calculated to confer some educational benefit. Not a lot, it's not a Cadillac, but some educational benefit, um, which means an IEP is adequate if it is calculated to confer an educational benefit that is merely more than de minimis, meaning the absolute bare minimum. So I would argue um, over time where we got a lot of um, circuits and, and districts was the Pinto was fine. Um, so in Andrew, Andrew F, the Supreme, US Supreme Court basically, not using my Pinto term, uh, but basically said a Pinto is not good enough. Um, the Supreme Court noted a student offered merely more than a de minimis progress from year to year can hardly be said to have been offered an education at all, much less FAPE. Um, the IDEA demands more. It requires an educational program that is reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. So while the court declined to create a bright line rule, the court clearly rejected more than de minimis and some educational benefit standards. The Pinto was shot down. Um, these standards that had been developed over time by lower courts and the Supreme Court raised the bar for a fate for children who are not fully mainstreamed. So unlike rally, um, where the student was in a general education curriculum, uh, a general education classroom, in other words, the old fashioned term mainstreamed, in Andrew F, that child was not mainstreamed. Uh, however, a lot of the principles that were established in Andrew F had across all these lines. Um, for example, the IEP has to be reasonably calculated. It's a, now a prospective judgment as to what the potential for this child may be. Of course, that's an area ripe for controversy, um, but schools, again, it goes back to the original purpose of the IDEA. They need to be looking forward. What's the potential for this child with education, with uh, employment, with being able to live independently, uh, may not be on their own. It may be in a group home. It may be with their parents, but we need to be keeping our eyes forward. Uh, Andrew F., the court said the child has to make progress. A substantive standard not focused on student progress would do little to remedy the pervasive and tragic academic stagnation that prompted Congress to act in the first place. And then potential for growth. Um, this is new language requiring a prospective assessment of how much progress is reasonable to expect of this child in light of his circumstances may affect private placement cases if child overperforms there. Um, so where in the past, courts, lower courts, um, if a <clears throat> child did really good in a private placement, they would just say, well, that doesn't count because you took the school out of the public school. We're just looking at the public school. And now after injury, um, positive performance in a, in, a, in a private school where the child is privately placed by the parents now supports the argument that the school did not provide the child faith and makes it more likely uh, that parents could uh, prevail on those uh, claims. Andrew said uh, these IEPs have to be appropriately ambitious. It's required for IEPs for children not fully integrated and not expected to pass from grade to grade. Um, every child should have a chance to meet challenging objectives. So you can't just dumb it down for um, the kids that uh, uh, may have lower intellectual capacity or lower functioning skills. Um, every child should be given challenging object objectives. And I highlight this point for advocates. Um, schools, uh, the expectation of the court is that schools will be all along the way providing a cogent and responsive explanation for the decisions that they make about the child's education. And anyone who, out there who's done any special ed advocacy is giggling because schools never explain why. It's just no. That's pretty much the answer that parents consistently get is just no. 
no explanation as to why that's not appropriate for that specific, specific child. So now uh, schools are on notice that the court's expecting them to provide this cogent and responsive explanation all along the way. Um, so in the end, Andrew kept prong one of rally that procedural violations are definitely a denial of FAPE. However, that they limited that, <coughs> excuse me, by saying a denial of FAPE is only procedural violation if it's actually impeded the free and appropriate public ed education, or it significantly impeded the parent's opportunity to participate, or it caused a deprivation of educational benefits. So they kind of narrowed uh, what procedural violations would be recoverable. And then uh, a, a, what I consider an important case that came in after Andrew, MC v. Antelope Valley, um, in that Ninth Circuit case, they applied to Andrew and the court held that the school must implement an IEP reasonably calculated to remediate and accommodate the child's disabilities, taking into account the child's potential. Um, so this um, need to actually remediate skills uh, was actually recognized um, by the Ninth Circuit. And then future areas of disagreement that are going to come up under Andrew, Andrew F um, is what is the child's potential? Um, that's up for debate and what's an appropriately ambitious goal um, that's definitely going to be up for debate as we go along. All right, least restrictive environment. Uh, I really kind of covered this already. There's a continuum of locations where children can be educated. Uh, we need to make sure that there's a discussion of all the options and that schools are considering all of these options. Um, the IEP is the primary vehicle by which schools and parents decide how to deliver FAPE. Uh, the basic components of an IEP, it, there's a present level of performance uh, or PLOP, you may, that's the old term. <laughs> the schools always call it something different now. It's usually a lot longer word, but anyway. Uh, but this is how's the child doing academically, behaviorally, functionally. This is where you put test results in. Um, a lot of times the schools will try to be really skimpy in this area. Why? Because the present performance drives the goals and the accommodations and the services that the child is going to receive. So if they keep it real thin and not a lot of information in that section, they're gonna be held to a lower standard in the other sections. So it's very incumbent upon advocates that we make sure that the clock is as robust as we can get it. Um, whether uh, the child was found eligible under a certain disability category is irrelevant. Um, disability category does not drive services, supports, accommodations. What does is this present level of performance. So if the child, for example, was found eligible under other health impairment for ADHD, but we have documentation from say psychologists or psychiatrists saying the child also suffers from anxiety and depression, then we need to make sure that that is covered in that plot because uh, goals or services or accommodations to address that anxiety or depression would be expected in the IEP, even though the child didn't qualify under those disabilities. Um, so again, we wanna make sure this is a robust section of the IEP. Again, the annual, annual goals, accommodation services, um, driven by the PLOP, not by the disability category. Um, these goals, uh, what should the child be able to do by the end of the year? And these are not just academic goals, but also functional goals or behavioral goals. Um, accommodations, what program modifications or supports are needed for the child. Um, I always uh, request that if the child has a behavior intervention plan that it's noted in the accommodation section. The plan itself should not be part of the IEP. The nature of a behavior intervention plan for a child with disruptive behaviors um, is that it's, it can be modified regularly. It's, it's supposed to be modified regularly, not, um, so if it's part of the IEP, you'd have to call an IEP team meeting every couple of so behavior intervention plan should not be actually part of the IEP, but it should be referenced in the accommodation section. And then services, what special education related services or supplementary aids and services are needed to help the child obtain their annual goals, um, to be involved in and make progress in the general curriculum and extracurricular or non-academic activities. And what do you need to ensure that the child is able to be educated in the least restrict restrictive environment? And I'm doing a whole slide on transition services. This is an area that schools really are not good um, at, uh, but so I try to highlight it so advocates can keep an eye out for these transition services. And it goes back to, again, and I know I sound like a broken record, but the purpose of the IDEA, 
we need to be thinking about what happens after school, what happens after they graduate or matriculate out. And that's where the transition services portion of the IEP um, really focuses. And so uh, the, this section of the IEP is designed to facilitate the child's movement from school to college, work, or independent living. Uh, these services must begin no later than the first IEP drafted in the year when the child will turn 16. That's the IDEA itself. But in Virginia, again, they provided additional rights, and now that has to start at age 14. That can start earlier, however, um, and in some cases that's very appropriate, um, but it must start by 14 in Virginia. The IB team must review age-appropriate transition assessments that are related to training, education, employment, and where appropriate independent living skills. The IB team must develop appropriately ambitious and measurable, again, the Andrew F standard, post-secondary goals and identify transition services, which can include courses of study that will enable the student to make progress toward those goals in light of the student's individual circumstances. And it's important to note when you're gonna have an IEP meeting and that's going to address transition services, um, there's two folks that have to be invited. Um, the student, him or herself, and if the student doesn't want to come or can't come, uh, then the school should, uh, basically interview the child and be able to report on what the child's interests are, um, what their ideas of what they want to do after school may be, um, and if they have certain goals or objectives they want to achieve. So someone needs to be speaking for the child if the child can't be there. And then also the uh, uh, agency who would be helping implement the goal of the ser transition services that would be in the IEP. In Virginia, that's DARS, the Department of Aging and Rehabilitative Services. And DARS has a representative in every single high school in Virginia. So that person is there. Sometimes they're hard to figure out who they are <laughs> and to connect with them. There is a separate application and acceptance process that students have to go through with the DARS agency itself outside of the school. But once that's in place, DARS has lots of resources and services. And, uh, they have job shadowing programs and uh, how to write a resume sessions and, and they do all kinds of things. They can also provide things for a student. For example, they could pay for a job coach uh, who could actually go into a volunteer or uh, for uh, pay placement that the child may be in to help them transition into a work environment, to work on skills that they would need to be able to perform appropriately in a work environment. So there's a lot that can happen. Um, but DARS is an important agency for advocates to know about because it's an important piece of these transition services. All right, IP meetings have to be held within 30 calendar, calendar days of the eligibility decision, have to include the parent. Um, the point is uh, to work with the parent towards consensus. Um, I thought this died 10 years ago, and I heard a client talk about it in one of their recent IP meetings. Um, we don't vote at IEP meetings. <laughs> There's no voting. That is not a thing in IEP meetings, all right? We're supposed to be working towards consensus, consensus between the school team members and the parent and their team members. And if there is not consensus, then that's documented in a prior written notice, very unfortunate name. I don't know why it's called a prior written notice because it comes after <laughs> something has been approved or denied. But the point is um, that has to be documented, but there is no voting in IEP meetings. Um, that's just not how it works. And these IEPs have to be based on the child's individual needs, not on the available placements or services, and you have to provide a placement in the least restrictive environment to the maximum extent appropriate for that specific child. It's not appropriate for every single child with disabilities to be in a general education uh, classroom. It just isn't. Um, but that decision has to be made by the IEP team. All right, schools have to implement all elements of the IEP. Implementation failures may be challenged in due process if a denial of FAPE. Parents are entitled to periodic progress reports. Um, IEPs have to be reviewed and revised not less than annually. And children have to be reevaluated at least every three years. That's the minimum. But they can be evaluated more frequently, just not less, free, or less than one year apart because a lot of standardized tests can't be given more than one year, less than a year apart. Um, so really that magic window for reevaluations is one to three years, but certainly they should be um, reevaluated at least every three years and to not do so would be a procedural violation. 
Um, and then children have to be evaluated before changing their eligibility. All right, I have a whole big section here on discipline of students with disabilities. I'm gonna blow through a lot of this so we can get to some of the other slides, um, but just know that there is extra protection um, it, there uh, when special IDA and also Section 504 and ADA protections kick in is when the children have been removed from school for more than 10 days, either consecutive or if there's a pattern of behavior, they're being expelled every time for similar behavior. And within one year, that adds up to 11 days. On day 11, that's when the procedural protections um, in the IDEA, also Section 504 and ADA, um, they're interpreted exactly the same way, um, but those protections kick in. All right, and let's see, I'll let you guys review some of that. But uh, one of the things that has to happen is uh, the school has to hold a manifestation determination review hearing or MDR hearing. Um, and that's where they're supposed to look at what is this child's disabilities, their functional abilities, is the bad behavior or that got them in trouble, is that a manifestation of that disability? Um, some of the problems uh, that I see, I'll go here real quick, is that the school only looks at the disability category and not the disabilities. Again, a student can qualify under which is one disability, but could have 10 disabilities. Um, so the schools fail to consider all of the disabilities of the child as an advocate. That's what we need to ensure. That's what they're supposed to be doing. Sometimes the school ignores symptomology reflected in evaluations. For example, a kid with ADHD that's very impulsive. Um, if their bad behavior was something that was an impulsivity <laughs> that the child exhibited, then uh, that is uh, uh, a manifestation of their ADHD and therefore the protections provided under IDEA and all these laws um, should go into effect. Um, a lot of times, <laughs> what I can't, if I had a penny for every one I've heard this in the NBR, he knew what he was doing. Well, maybe he did, but that's irrelevant. That is not the standard of review for a manifestation termination. The point is, is the behavior a manifestation of the child's disability? And if it is, you can't suspend the, the, the kid. The kid has to come back into the classroom. So um, again, if the conduct is not a manifestation of the student's disability, the school may change the student's placement um, which means they could suspend the child, but they must provide FAPE during that removal and as appropriate provide a functional behavioral assessment, which then leads to the creation of, beha of a behavior intervention plan. Um, and so providing FAPE during removal, that could be uh, home-based instruction, that could be the child is removed to a different facility and has provided their educational services there, um, but even if the school decides this is not a manifestation of the student's disability, they are still required by the law to provide faith to that child while they're out of school. Um, services during removal must start on, on the 11th day of removal and allow the student to make progress to their, toward their goals and participate in the general curriculum, although that's gonna be in a different setting. Um, if the behavior is a manifestation of the disability, um, oh, sorry. If the behavior is a manifestation of the disability, the school must return the child to the original placement unless the parents of the school agree otherwise, they have to conduct a functional behavioral assessment and develop a behavior intervention plan. Or if the BIP was already in place, they have to review and modify it. So that's if the school does find the behavior to be a manifestation. Okay, when does uh, when do IDEA services end? They can be terminated when the child turns 22 in Virginia um, but they can finish that school year. So if they turn 22 in October, they still get services till the end of that school year. Um, if the school graduates with a regular or advanced diploma, GED doesn't count. If they graduate with a GED, they get services through the year they turn 22. Or if the child actually overcomes the disability. Um, but unless the child ages out or graduates with a regular advanced diploma, evaluations must be performed and parents must give consent before a change in eligibility. Common disputes that are out there, eligibility, uh, failure to provide FAPE, failure to implement an IEP, and of course, inappropriate discipline. Uh, I did mention that it's possible for a parent to pull their child from the school, privately place them, and then seek reimbursement from the school through various uh, procedural processes. 
Um, but the important thing to remember there, if you're going to do that and you want to actually get reimbursed, you have to either tell the school at the IEP meeting before removing the child um, your concerns with the IEP, that it doesn't provide FAPE, and that you intend to enroll your child and seek payment at public expense, or 10 business days before removing the child, you write a letter basically saying the same thing. Um, but the courts uh, are pretty stringent on this, actually, even though it's not a hard and fast rule, but it would be crazy not to do one of these two things because in Virginia, you, you might not get reimbursed. Um, different dispute resolution options. Of course, there's informal resolution. Um, as an attorney, I'm able to do this a lot uh, where we just negotiate attorney to attorney uh, to come up with a settlement and create a contract uh, to reflect the, the solutions that were arrived at by the family in the school. Families can file a state complaint with the Virginia Department of Education, and actually anyone can file a state complaint. Um, uh, the investigation is done by the Virginia Department of Education. They have 60 days to decision, but they oftentimes request extensions. The school does too. Um, and there's a one-year statute of limitations for that. So you have one year from the time you knew or should have known about the violation to file the complaint. You can request mediation. That is actually paid for, the mediator's paid for by the school. Um, they're chosen off of a list that's maintained um, by uh, the Supreme Court of Virginia. And uh, this can be a very uh, productive way of resolving disputes. It was much better in years past. Um, I understand from other advocates it's getting better. It was really bad for a period of time, but it's getting better. Um, same with state complaint uh, process. But if you really, you don't wanna go through these processes, uh, you're not required to, you can go straight to due process, but there's a very expensive undertaking um, and win or lose or draw at, at due process, you then could appeal to either federal or state court. Stay put is a concept in the law. It says that during litigation, from the beginning of the filing of a due process request, the child stays in their current educational placement until a decision is made. The way in the trenches this works, um, and for a myriad of reasons, it's really been driven by the school districts, but they consider stay put to be in place whenever there's a dispute um, with the family over anything, whether or not due process has been filed or not. So you, stay put, it, you'll hear that a lot, but it just means that while we're figuring this out, the kid, you know, the IEP that's in place stays in place, which makes sense because until the parents agree and, and sign consent, they can't change the IEP anyway. <clears throat> and the current educational placement uh, is where all their services can be provided. Um, and there's no, but there's no stay put for disciplinary uh, appeals. And I'm gonna let you guys read some of these details about uh, the different uh, appeal mechanisms. I will mention for due process where a complaint is one year, you have one year to file. For a due process hearing requesting that, you have two years um, to file. Okay, let's skip over, because hopefully you'll never have to do a due process hearing. Okay, section 504, before I move on, we saw about 45 minutes and for me to cover two more laws, but it won't take nearly as long as the IDEA did. So let me take a break here and see if there's any pressing burning questions. Okay, um, let's see. Melissa, I guess one thing that I wanted to mention to people um, is, so as you said, anybody really can express to the school their concern or suspe suspicion that a child may have a disability, including a judge. I just want to point out, since a lot of our attendees are CASAs, um, you know, the wording, because I've actually experienced it where the judge sort of wrote, this child should be tested for an IEP that's an order of the court. And the school said, well, no. I mean, he can't really force us to test the child. Um, that's an educational decision. Um, so the instruction that we got from the um, school's attorney was that any future orders from the judge should say something like, you know, the judge is concerned that this child has a disability. And then, you know, that should trigger the school to deliberate. And that was kind of um, the IEP teams or the eligibility teams um, statement back that, well, he can't order us to test, but we're participating in child fine by having this meeting and declining to test the child was kind of their position. So any response or feedback to that? 
Yeah, in all fairness, that's true. Anybody can request, make a referral for a special education evaluation, but the decision whether or not to actually evaluate lies with the school, as does the responsibility. So if they refuse, then you could file due process, go to mediation, file a state complaint as a child find violation that they had reason to suspect, reason to believe that this child had a disability and they refused to evaluate. And if a judge has said this, it, there's so much going on here that this kid really needs an IEP, that is not gonna look good for them in a complaint or mediation or certainly not in court. So I, I would argue they're technically correct the judge doesn't order that you uh, can't order that you give them an IEP or order that they evaluate, but the judge certainly can make the referral um, for the child to be evaluated. And a school, I think, puts them, themselves in severe uh, jeopardy if they were to ignore a judge making a request that the child be evaluated. Okay. Um, we've gotten multiple questions about what is the school's obligation um, during virtual learning and the pandemic. You know, a lot of our kids, especially that we serve as CASA, really struggle uh, to stay focused and engaged. Um, with our kids, the relationship piece is so important. So the, the distance learning is making it even more difficult. Um, I mean, that's such a big topic. Any um, generalizing thoughts, I guess. Yeah, generally speaking, it's been tough all over. And of course, the, the schools have the perfect excuse, COVID. Um, but, you know, they've, they've had almost a year now to figure it out. So those excuses are going to start, you know, becoming, having less strength, right? You know, they, they, they've had a year now to figure out how to provide faith to these kids with disabilities. Um, you know, one of the most egregious things that we saw up here is school districts were um, just kind of tacking on to these IEPs and getting parents to sign these uh, distance learning IEPs that basically said, it's okay for us to cut services um, as we decide see fit and your approval. I mean, it was just, it was just crazy town. And so of course we strike all that out and, and they really didn't push back against it because they knew it was crazy what they were asking. But, um, but anyway, um, so the schools have tried to get away with a lot of stuff, but it is hard. And you know, if, if uh, one thing to keep in mind in the school district is uh, this equity issue, kind of the think of the 504 ADA equality arguments, are they providing an equal education? So for example, if they're allowing, um, you know, athletes to come into the school, if they're allowing uh, kids to come into the school to work out, um, then how can they not allow kids with disabilities to come into the school to receive their services? So where, you know, it, it's kind of this equity of, of access question. And so those are kind of the, the approaches we've taken. Now, VDOE has already said, um, they've kind of created this new category of called recovery services. Um, so they're trying to take it out of the realm of compensatory education, which is what we typically have, um, when the school hasn't provided all the hours it was supposed to or whatever. Um, and so how these, in fact, I'm attending a seminar on this in a couple of weeks about, you know, what they mean by recovery services and, and how that's going to play out. So this is all being figured out still. I wish I had answers and could say, oh, do this one thing. But unfortunately, we're all just, you know, muddling through. Yes. Yeah. So, Understood. And I'll try and make sure that um, maybe in the email that I send to people, uh, send you, because there are all kinds of webinars and different things going on around mm -hmm. that topic. Um, Melissa, I also wanted to point out to people and confirm if this would be your advice. So a lot of times in eligibility or IEP meetings, um, even though it's not supposed to be a majority vote, sometimes yeah. that is exactly what it feels like. You just get outgunned and um, but a lot of times I don't see the disagreeing point of view reflected in the concerns or documentation of the meeting. I just see wording of, well, the team opted not to do this and the team felt it was better 
um, to do this instead. So the advice that I have heard is that, you know, the parent or, you know, if the parent isn't participating, perhaps CASA or DSS should really write their own documentation of their understanding of what occurred in the meeting, um, their concerns, and then make sure that they send that to the school and that it gets filed with the records of that meeting. Is that correct advice? That's correct. Now, you can request that edits be made to a prior written notice. If you disagree, like, uh, we didn't talk about that at all, or why is there absolutely no, dis you know, anything written here about our discussion of a private placement for this kid? You know, I mean, if they're missing big chunks of things, it's it's perfectly within the realm of appropriate behavior to to email the contact the school and point those things out and ask that the, uh, uh, the PWM be revised. That's one option. And then the second, if, if they're not willing to do that, then the next choice is then to provide um, written documentation to the school and request that that be included with the prior written notice in the child's records. Um, so that is another option. And the big thing there is documenting the disagreement because if you do go to mediation, well, file a complaint, um, potentially go to mediation, but certainly if you go to due process and that ultimately goes to court, you're gonna need that documentation of the disagreement. Um, so it's good that it's there. And even if you don't go to court or file due process now, um, a year from now, they might still be doing the same horrible thing, in which case you you want to have documented the problem now, because remember, it's a two-year statute of limitations. So even though you don't file for another year or year and a half, you know, you, you could still include this violation as well because you've documented it. Gotcha. Um, and I wanted to ask too, um, you mentioned the importance of having a robust plop or present level of performance since that really drives the services that the child is entitled to. I've heard a lot of advice that um, this is a great place for the parent to document their concerns that they're bringing to the table. Um, and I wanted to verify if that was your advice. And again, if a parent isn't involved or if, is this a place where CASA or DSS could also make sure, or a GAL for that matter, could also make sure that their concerns for the child are documented? And how would you recommend? Because again, I don't necessarily know that our concerns will always make it into the notes if we just ask verbally during the meeting or share. So would it be good to kind of, um, you know, send that to the school ahead of time or provide a copy at the meeting of our con written concerns? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I would send it ahead of time because a lot of times the schools will create a draft IEP and I always ask for one in advance of an IEP meeting. Um, some schools it's just perfunctory to send it out in advance, but it's great because then you can review it in advance, see what you don't like or what you want to question or how you want to reword a goal. And I just in red write all over these draft IEPs and then as we go through, I have all my notes there, right? So, but the, there is a section in the IEPs for parent concerns. Uh, it's near the plop, and if you provide that in advance, a lot of times the schools will just cut, if you do it electronically, they'll just cut and paste that and put that in the parent concern section. That, that's one way I've seen it done. Um, the other way, some schools will actually project the IEP um, screen, the, the computer program up on, up on the either, well, now with Zoom up on the screen or before it was up on the wall or whatever, and there, you can actually see what they're typing as they're typing it in. Um, so that's a way to make sure what you want set in there, what the parent wants is, is put in there the way they want it. Other schools, they will summarize it themselves. They never get it right. It's always horrible. They leave 50 things out, um, in which case after they uh, send, when they give you the draft IEP to be signed or the IEP to be signed, you can review that. And if you don't like what it says, you can send it back and ask them to change it. Or um, you, if they refuse to change it, then you could write your own set, if you haven't already, of concerns and then send that in and, and request that that be attached or included with the IEP. Um, so there's the options there. And one quick thing that I will mention, because it's a it's a, a unique, another Virginia uh, unique thing that really helps parents, um, is partial consent. And a lot of people don't realize that it is possible in Virginia to provide partial consent to the IEP. So for example, if you're, um, you're all on board with uh, the child, for example, that maybe they're giving them more speech therapy hours and you really want that to start right away, or maybe they weren't even giving speech and now they've agreed to give speech, but the goals are terrible, um, or there's still a debate about, 
you know, private placement, but the rest of it you're okay with. It is possible to say um, you just handwrite at the bottom of the IEP before you sign it, you know, I uh, provide consent to all but, you know, the placement decision um, in this IEP, or, um, you know, I only provide consent to the new speech service hours, but I do not agree with the rest of the IEP. You know, whatever the case may be, you can handwrite that at the bottom of the IEP and then sign it and turn it in. Um, so uh, I just wanna make sure people are aware there is a thing in Virginia um, called partial consent to IEPs. And it's so that the P what Virginia Department of Education said is, look, we want kids to get what they need as quickly as possible. And if there's agreement on 50% of it, let's get that going. So the kids get at least you know 50% of what they need while we debate and figure out the rest of it. And Melissa, I wanted to uh, give you one more question, but also tell me if we're eating up too much time here and, and we need to move on. But um, I do no more questions. Okay. Um, I did want to, you know, just revisit because the biggest obstacle that I consistently experience in my caseload is getting getting the school to agree to do the comprehensive evaluation for a child. And we were talking about this a little bit in the chat. So a lot of times the form that I take this C is, or that I that I see this take is um, a the school may in some ways benefit from maybe whoever has the concern not putting those concerns or the request in writing to the school because we know that when the school receives the request in writing that triggers that timeline of 10 days that they have to respond legally speaking that's in black and white but a lot of times um, these conversations may occur more informally um, and a lot of times too what I feel like I see is really the deliberation about whether the child will be eligible or not seems to occur in a child study meeting before the child is right, right. ever evaluated. Oh, we don't yes. think they will be eligible, therefore we don't need to be. It's just behavior. They can do it mm -hmm. when they try. Um, so yeah, what general feedback or advice do you have around that? And even again, like even when the request has been made and we come to the table to discuss, and obviously there are very divergent points of view about whether testing should take place or not. Um, and it just keeps sort of getting batted away by the school. Mm -hmm. Well, it, yes. And, and I think it's just reminding them of their child find responsibility, which is to evaluate children that there's a suspicion that there could be a disability. Not definitive answer, but a suspicion. And what causes a suspicion? Are they getting bad grades? Are they being suspended regularly? Um, are they you know, been missing school because they're being suspended? Are they you know, falling behind academically? You know, I mean, what is the red flag? Clearly somebody had saw a red flag or this wouldn't have even been brought up in the first place. And so I think bringing the conversation back to the fact that at this point, it's irrelevant if we think he's going to qualify. We can't possibly know that until he's been evaluated or she. Um, the point of the evaluation and, and the trigger for the evaluation is if there's a suspicion that there could be a disability. So, for example, if you have a kid who has a diagnosis from somebody of ADHD or a diagnosis of some, from somebody of anxiety or a diagnosis from somebody of dyslexia, the diagnosis alone is enough to raise a suspicion that there's a disability. <laughs> so it doesn't matter whether they think it affects him in school. It doesn't matter if they think there's, you know, uh, if he needs special education services. At the child find point where you're making a determination whether to evaluate or not, all that matters, do you have as a school, have a suspicion that there's a disability? That's it. And you just have to keep reminding them of the law. And so this, it sounds like, is where downloading that Virginia DOE regulations and carrying it around with you, if you have to, it might be helpful. And again, Melissa, it, it sounds like we'll go into this and there might be some interplay. But again, what I see a lot of times with kids on our caseload is, okay, no, we won't test, but here's a 504 plan as a compensation prize. Let's stop yeah. there. Um, and I would 
guess that you're going to tell us that a section 504 can be great and if that fully meets the child's needs then awesome but if that is not meeting the child's needs just because a child has a 504 plan does not remove the school's obligation obligation under idea to test the child correct and there's supposed to be an evaluation for the 504 plan as well now, they may not do extensive testing, but there is an evaluation process um, with Section 504 as well um, that's included in the 504 regulations, but we'll get to that. But, um, but yes, so 504 isn't, you know, completely, you know, the, the booby prize or whatever with no value, although um, historically schools have treated it that way and have provided services in that way. But the law actually is quite robust, not as, as robust as IDEA by any stretch, um, but a lot more than what the schools will let on that it is. So that's a good segue. Let me go ahead and, and let's get into to, to that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, the Rehabilitation Act of 1975 has a section, section 504, that's relevant for special education. And this section is a broad civil rights or non-discrimination law that applies to schools and colleges. So that's important because you have to keep in mind an IDEA is only uh, valid, only follows a child until they graduate or matriculate out of the public schools. But a 504 will follow the student into college. Um, uh, what it provides for is accommodations, modifications, services, and improve building accessibility to provide access to education. Access is, is the key. What does the kid need to have equal access to non-disabled kids to whatever it is the school is providing? Um, so how are you eligible under Section 504? And I will remind people that this eligibility discussion is exactly the same for ADA, for the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, but to be eligible under either one of these laws, you have to have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So if you don't need special education services, you're still eligible for protection under Section 504. And as um, I had mentioned before, for example, a diabetic child with insulin issues or a child with a nut or bee allergy um, that is not missing a lot of school, um, then you know, 504 is a perfectly valid uh, instrument in which to uh, document the protections, the accommodations and modifications for that child. Um, it's interesting to note a Section 504 plan does not have to be written. An IEP does, but a 504 plan does not. Um, and it does not require parental consent uh, to be legally enforceable. However, um, schools would be crazy not to write um, Section 504 plans down. Um, but in truth, there's no legal requirement for that. Um, there are legal remedies if a school district discriminates, excludes, or retaliates against a parent, child, or school district employee who's exercising their rights. Um, and you can file an OCR complaint um, through the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights, a complaint, or file in federal court. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, Section 504, Services and Accommodations. So Section 504 requires that students with disabilities be given comparable aids, benefits, and services to those provided to non-disabled students in the least restrictive environment. There's still an LRE requirement under 504 ADA. And so these comparable aids and services, this includes music class, art class, physical education, lunch, um, the services that are provided through the guidance office, uh, equal access to vocational training programs um, offered through the high school. I had a case, it's been quite a few years ago now, but um, where there was a welding class offered in the school and the kid was very, very interested in welding and mechan um, auto mechanics, that kind of thing. But because he had behavioral issues, he was told that he couldn't uh, take that class. And so that was a clear violation um, that based on his disability, um, he was not able to take um, a class that was offered to non-disabled students um, because certainly they could have provided appropriate modifications and support so he could have safely taken the class. So that's just one example. Um, unlike with IDEA where the Supreme Court and rally rejected this comparative or equal standard um, in Section 504 and ADA, 
that is the requirement. That is the standard. It's got to be equal. It's got to be comparative or comparable to what um, non-disabled students are receiving from the school. Um, Section 504 protection, it protects a qualified individual with a disability um, who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities um, or a record of such an impairment or is regarded as having such an impairment. Um, and the regarded as having, it's uh, an example of that is back when AIDS was very scary and um, uh, people had a lot of fear in the workplace, in the school environment. So students who maybe their parents were um, HIV positive, they were, even though they weren't um, HIV positive, they were being discriminated against. Um, so they were regarded as having HIV, even though they actually didn't. So that was kind of how that's used. But the most important thing for our purposes is prong one. And um, this protection applies to people of all ages although um, there's no FAPE, free appropriate public education requirement post-secondary in college or VOTEC school. So after they graduate from public school, we don't have the FAPE requirement in 504 and 88 anymore. But during uh, the time that the kids are in public school, there is a, a FAPE requirement under these laws. It's in the regulations. Um, and this applies whether the student needs special education or not, but FAPE only applies to those in prong one and as long as they're in, in um, uh, public school, um, of, well, of that age group, um, then uh, FAPE does apply. And so uh, there is an exclusion though for individuals who are currently engaging in illegal drug use, unless they're in a rehab program and no longer engaging in illegal drug use. So there's there are a whole lot of regulations and I'm gonna skip over a lot of that as we go along, but related to um, possession of drugs versus use of drugs, blah, blah, blah. So you, you, if that's the issue, you're going to have to dig a little deeper than what I'm going to cover today to, to get those answers. But um, keep in mind that Section 504 and ADEA's FAPE is a different standard from the FAPE standard in IDEA. Um, it is the equality standard rejected in both Rowley and Andrew. Um, IDEA focuses on meeting individual needs of the student. It's an affirmative duty to educate these students while Section 504 and ADA, it's about providing educational services that are equivalent to those offered non-disabled students. It's a comparative obligation. So think about um, in the rally case, when it was very well documented, there's all kinds of documentation that she was um, uh, taking in much, much significantly less, like 40% less information, she was able to get that, glean that out of the classroom than all the other students, the non-disabled students. And in rally, because it was brought under the IDEA, that was rejected. But there's a lot of speculation that if they had brought this under 504, that they probably would have won. Um, because clearly she was not receiving equal access to the classroom. And it was well documented and she wasn't. Um, and then of course, 504 and ADA contain what IDEA does not. And that is a prohibition um, oh, sorry, there's a prohibition against discrimination, which also is not in the IDEA, and also there is a anti-retaliation provision, which is very important. A lot of times our parents are being retaliated against. They start advocating and all of a sudden they get CPS knocking at their door um, or um, other things are being withdrawn from their other children. Um, it's just, or their kids are being, they start advocating their kids are now, services are now pulled from their children. Um, there's just a lot of retaliation out there, and we um, fight that under 504 and PDA. Uh, Section 504 regulations require that public schools provide FAPE to each qualified handicapped person. Free, this includes cost of transportation and residential placements. I just today had um, a parent tell me the school told her that under 504, she couldn't get a private placement for her son. And um, that's just flat not true. <laughs> um, they can they can even not just a private day school, but they can actually um, be required to provide a residential placement for these kids. Those are that's also in these regulations, and a lot of people, a lot of schools, don't realize that. Um, what's appropriate? Uh, it's regular or special education and related aids and services designed to meet the individual educational needs of disabled children as adequately as the needs of non-disabled children. And you have to comply with the Section 504 procedural requirements, the regulations. 
So in addition to equal academic opportunities, students with a disability must receive equal opportunity to participate in athletics. That is in the law. Um, they have to have an equal opportunity to participate in extracurricular activities. They have to be able to go on field trips. I had a field trip case a few years back, um, but they are required. You have to, the school has to make appropriate accommodations so that these children can participate equally in field trips. Um, and they also have to be free from bullying and harassment um, that's based on their disability. Um, this is something that OCR takes very seriously, um, bullying. However, uh, this, the bar is pretty low uh, for how the schools have to respond to bullying. Pretty much if there's any documented response to a notification of bullying, um, they kind of get a, get a jail free card. Um, but certainly in the cases where a school has been notified about bullying and has done absolutely nothing to prevent it or to protect the child who's being bullied, um, that would be a strong case under 504 in the end. Now, Section 504 discrimination, I'm going to walk through this. And in ADA, I'm going to walk through this section as well because they are a little bit different. Um, but in Section 504, um, in the regulations, the schools are specifically prohibited from denying a student with disabilities the opportunity to participate in or benefit from an aid, benefit, or service. And a service would be education, providing an education to children. That's a service. The comparable opportunities requirement that includes non-academic and extracurricular activities as well. Um, giving a student with disabilities an aid or benefit or service that is not equal to that afforded others. Uh, a, a really a strong 504 ADA case, the, parent, the family won. Um, actually, I think that may have been a class action lawsuit now I think about it. Um, but the school was basically saying that kids with disabilities, they would be dismissed from the school day uh, I think it was 15, 20 minutes early every day um, so that they could get onto their um, special transportation buses. And this was ruled to be discriminatory because they lost 15 to 20 minutes of instructional time that non-disabled students were receiving every school day. Um, so that's kind of an example of not getting something equal. They didn't get an equal amount of instructional time as non-disabled students. Um, providing a student with disabilities with an aid, benefit, or service that's not as effective as that provided to others. Um, I have been chomping at the bit uh, to be able to take a case to federal court on this issue um, so that uh, we can get this uh, in the case law, because I would argue that providing an instructional methodology that is documented to be less effective would be a violation of Section 504. For example, it is very well known that children with dyslexia need to be taught in, in a certain way. Um, and so at using certain methodologies and schools are very, very resistant to this. And so um, I think there's a good, a right case to be had that uh, an argument could be made not providing um, uh, method, teaching methodologies that are as effective for the child with a disability, say for example, dyslexia, as they are for children who are non-disabled would be a violation or would be discrimination under section 504. So anyway, um, I haven't been able to have the case that, that settled, but uh, there, um, I would love to be able to take a case actually court and get case law now. Um, but it's certainly something we need to be arguing as we're advocating. And also discrimination, otherwise limiting the student with disabilities in the enjoyment of any right, privilege, advantage, or opportunity enjoyed by others receiving an aid benefit or service from the school. Um, so for example, the school offers to pay for a PSAT for its students, but students with disabilities are excluded from that. That would be a violation of Section 504. Um, a school may not ban students with disabilities from participating in vocational training opportunities simply because they have a disability. I told you about that case already. The educational needs of most students with disabilities to practice for the SAT or to learn vocational skills is exactly the same as for non-disabled students and must be addressed as adequately as they are addressed for non-disabled students. Um, I could give lots of examples of these things, but I'll move it along. However, please note that the circuit courts have held that in order to prove intentional discrimination in the educational context, a parent must show something more than just the discrimination itself. And here where we live in the Fourth Circuit, 
um, a parent has to show either bad faith or gross misjudgment on the part of the school in order to prevail on the Section 504 claims. Whoops, excuse me. Um, okay, let me dig down a little bit deeper on eligibility. Um, eligibility under Section 504, as we said, requires a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, this is exactly the same under Americans with Disabilities Act. And luckily, in 2008, we got the ADA amendments, which it expanded the scope of protection under both of these laws. Um, the question of whether an individual is disabled should not demand extensive analysis, so said Congress. Ameliorating effects of mitigating measures other than eyeglasses or contacts may not be considered. So for example, a kid with ADHD who's well medicated, you can't take into consideration as to whether or not the ADHD um, substantially limits a major life activity, you can't take into consideration the ameliorative effects of the medication the child was taking. You've got to look back to before the time the child was medicated to see if there was a substantial limitation. As an example, um, the scope of major life activities is expanded and is stated clearly by Congress, it is non-exhaustive. So there could be more than the examples that they provide. An impairment that is episodic or in remission is a disability if it would substantially limit a major activity when it was active. And Congress clarified um, how the law applies to someone who's regarded as having a disability. Um, unfortunately, the term substantially limits is not defined in the regulation of the law or the regulations. The determination of whether an impairment substantially limits a major life activity is made on a case-by-case -case basis um, by Section 504 team, and they are supposed to use a variety of sources of information to include evaluations uh, to make this determination. And OCR has said a student would not be eligible if the impairment does not in any way limit the student's ability to learn or another major life activity or only results in some minor limitation in that regard. Um, activities are restricted as to the condition, manner, or duration under which they can be performed in comparison to most people. Um, it, does, it is not enough to simply rely on a medical diagnosis or a doctor's note on a prescription pad. Um, that gets you the physical impairment, but you also have to go to the next step and show how it affects you. Um, the school must consider other sources of information such as teacher observations, tests and evaluation data, and input from the school nurse, therapist, and parents. In addition, the school cannot simply rely on a student's grades in making a determination. This is super important with our 2E kids, the twice exceptional kids who have a disability but also have high intellectual capacity. Um, a lot of times they can compensate for their disability and, and make pretty good grades, uh, but that doesn't change the fact their disability affects their learning, their reading, their math calculations, whatever the case may be. Um, so you can't just rely on grades in making this determination. In passing the ADAA, Congress rejected the assumption that an individual with a specific learning disability who performs well academically cannot be substantially limited in activities such as learning, reading, writing, thinking, or speaking. Um, that's directly from the House of Representatives report on the amendments. Um, grades do not provide information on how much effort or how many outside resources like parents helping throughout the night <laughs> are required for the student to achieve those grades. Um, and students, uh, Congress said that students should not be penalized because of adaptive strategies or accommodations that lessen the deleterious impacts of their disability. Um, OCR has addressed more than once the issue of grades in determining whether a child is disabled under 504 in, in their responses to various complaints, but also in um, letters to superintendents and dear colleague letters, that kind of thing. Um, this has come up multiple times. Using the example of a child with dyslexia who spends more time preparing for class than other students and earns good grades because of the student's intelligence and extreme efforts, OCR says what still is substantially limited in the major life activity of reading. Um, and then I, there's a resource guide um, on the OCR website that you can look up that's fantastic on this issue and cited there. In a local complaint resolution, OCR said grades alone are a single source evaluation and do not necessarily accurately distinguish subsets of skills in a subject area or reflect how a student achieved the grades. Um, and that was out of Virginia. 
Um, mitigating measures. In the Amendments Act, Congress specifically rejected several U.S. Supreme Court cases that allowed for consideration of mitigating measures when determining eligibility under Section 504. Examples are medication. I mentioned the ADHD example. Medical equipment and devices, prosthetic limbs, low vision devices, hearing aids, mobility devices, oxygen therapy equipment, use of assistive technology, reasonable accommodations, auxiliary aids or services, and learned behavioral or adaptive neurological modifications. They can't take those into consideration when determining if someone is substantially limited. And uh, specifically excluded from this list are eyeglasses and contacts. Um, so you can take those into consideration. And uh, Congress said that this is not an exhaustive list. Mitigating measures also include informal educational interventions and accommodations. Um, we have a, a, a OCR uh, complaint where they said um, these accommodations could include preferential seating, checkoff lists, nonverbal cues, chunking, books on tape, reading interventions, a token system, repeating instructions, bathroom privileges, excuse tardies, extra time to make up missed work and home instruction. So for example, when I was saying we have a lot of school districts that will just be in this child study thing for years on end, those kids should have moved into Section 504 plans long ago. Because if you're having to provide all of these extra interventions for this child to make whatever success they're able to make in school, then clearly they are exhibiting a substantial limit limitation because without those things, without those mitigating measures, they would not be successful in school. And the fact that the school is providing them is evidence of that. So um, something else to keep in mind in our advocacy. And the question, would a, the child be substantially limited if these interventions or accommodations were not in place? So if the school pulled all these child study interventions away from the child, would they be doing as well as they're doing? That's the question. 504 teams should also consider the negative effects, for example, side effects of medication in determining if an individual is substantially limited in a major life activity. So what are these major life activities? This includes, it's not limited to, caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, standing, lifting, bending, speaking, breathing, learning, reading, concentrating, thinking, communicating. Um, our kids on the autism spectrum often have issues with this, kids with speech language disabilities, and working. So you can see our kids um, fit into a lot of these categories. And then major bodily functions is also considered a major life activity. Um, the big ones here, of course, I would say are, are brain, neurological, um, those can relate directly to educational issues, but any of these would count. Um, major life activities, a disability does not have to impact learning, academic performance, or the ability to attend class in order to qualify. So even if it affects um, their uh, some kind of activity out that doesn't ha apply in school, they still would qualify under Section 504. You don't have to show an impact on learning. OCR has clarified that schools need to consider how an impairment affects any major life activity and not just the activity of learning. In several letters of findings from complaint investigations, OCR has expressed concern when schools limit their consideration of a major life activity to only one activity, such as learning. So that's something they, they deem schools on multiple times. Um, discipline under 504, again, I, I'll kind of zoom through this, but um, uh, it, it's the same. OCR interprets Section 504 as requiring the same disciplinary protections as the IDEA when a subject student is subjected to a significant change in placement. And that's interpreted just like under IDEA. Um, once you're greater than 10 days, consecutive or cumulative, um, that's a significant change in placement, and that triggers the need for an MDR, Manifestation Determination Review Hearing. Um, less than 10 days, the school can do the same um, things that it would do to a non-disabled student, but greater than 10 days, a reevaluation is triggered under the regulations for Section 504, um, and OCR says that this includes an MDR, um, the Manifestation Determination Review Hearing, and it's conducted basically the same way as under IDEA. And if the team determines the misconduct is related to the disability, they have to reassess the Section 504 plan and placement to determine if it's still appropriate, and they have to consider a new or revised um, functional behavioral assessment and behavior intervention plan. But they can impose the same sanctions that they would impose on a non-disabled student, but they just have to do these um, few extra things. That's a little bit different from IDEA. 
Uh, Section 504 enforcement, as I mentioned before, it's the Office of Civil Rights. Um, anyone, a parent, student, or advocate can file a complaint with OCR, um, but this step where Virginia Department of Education complaints, you had a year. Um, at the federal level, it's only six months, 180 calendar days from the date of alleged discrimination. Um, but there are, in, that, in the uh, U.S. Department of Education complaint process, there are multiple steps in that process that um, where there are opportunities to settle the case. Um, so that can speed up the timeline as well. But these things, uh, OCR complaints can take many months um, to go through that whole process. Uh, but again, there's, there's off ramps. Uh, OCR will not review the content of a 504 plan, an IEP, an individual's placement, um, other educational decisions. They just, they don't wanna be making educational decisions. You have to go through due process for that. Um, but they will review identification or evaluation of students, the child fine responsibility under 504, um, procedural safeguards that may have been violated, and incidents where students with disabilities are treated differently. They will consider all of those things. Um, at any time, either you've already filed a complaint before, after, at any time you can file a federal lawsuit. There's no exhaustion requirement for the complaint process. Um, Unlike IDEA, there's no exhaustion requirement unless the plaintiff also seeks relief for a denial of fate, which in the case of what we do with special education is like 99.9% .9 of the time <laughs> will be the case. Uh, there's a recent case, Fry versus Napoleon uh, Community Schools in 2017. <coughs> Justice Kagan on the Supreme Court gave us a two-part test to figure out whether our claims are related to fate. She basically said, could this claim be brought if it occurred in a library or a public theater? And could an adult, as opposed to a child who maybe comes into a school, be able to raise this exact claim? And so if the answer is no, um, they could not, then the claim, whatever it is, Im uh, implicates fate. And in which case, the Supreme Court has said, you have to exhaust your administrative remedies through IDEA. In other words, you gotta go through due process. Um, so, and on that, uh, whereas IDEA and the Virginia regulations have very, very specific, lots of specific rules about how due process works. Unfortunately, we don't have 504 ADA regulations in Virginia. So it's up to the individual school districts. They can adopt the IDEA regulations to cover 504 and ADA issues, or they can adopt their own, which oftentimes might be, you know, where the purple book is many, many, many pages, um, a school district may adopt, you know, a, a 504 ADA regulations that are four or five pages. Um, so they're way uh, less robust. And, uh, but anyway, but you have to find out what it is, what's governing this due process that you want to request. And could it be filed together with an IDEA, with IDEA claims and an IDEA due process um, request, or does it have to be filed separately again? If they adopt the IDEA rules, they can all go together. Uh, the, the Virginia regulations for IDEA, if they have their own, they may have their own processes. They may have to have a separate um, due process hearing just for the 504 claims. But I will tell you in Virginia, most of the hearing officers in Virginia have taken the position they don't have a uh, constitutional authority to hear 504 and ADA claims. So often those are dismissed right off the bat, um, which then once that's done, you can go into federal court, but there is that extra layer um, uh, in the process of having to go through due process 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, ADA, like I said, everything is pretty much the same. Um, schools must take any action required to ensure that students with disabilities, is what SWD is, receive the same benefits and services offered non-disabled students. Um, there are special rules for equal access to school facilities, but also importantly, there's um, special regulations, ADA regulations for auxiliary aids and services to meet communication needs. Now, there is an OCR, um, I think it was a Dear Colleague letter, that basically says this includes uh, communication needs of people with dyslexia, um, but I don't, haven't seen any court cases on that yet, but generally um, it's for students with hearing disabilities. Um, to be able to communicate, but certainly OCR has intimated that their interpretation is much broader than just services um, provided for children with hearing um, deficits. Uh, again, denying an opportunity, um, giving an aid or benefits not equal, providing something's not as effective, and limiting the enjoyment. Um, 
But this one is interesting. They can't administer or establish requirements for a licensing or certification program that discriminates against a student with disabilities. And I think there's implications for a lot of vocational programs where it used to be VOTEC was like, oh, the, you know, dumb kids with no future do that, blah, blah, blah. It, the attitudes have changed completely. And now trying to get into these VOTEC programs has become very, very this training um, are, are being excluded um, through policies and procedures. So um, there's, uh, this is one place that there may be some relief, but uh, there's lots of opportunities and the definitions of discrimination in ADA and 504 that could cover that. Um, failing to make reasonable modifications in policies and practices or procedures necessary to avoid discrimination, um, unless it would fundamentally alter the nature of the service program or activity. Um, they can't impose or apply eligibility criteria that screen out disabled individuals. Uh, they can't fail to provide services or programs and activities in the most integrated setting appropriate. They can't impose a surcharge to cover the cost of measures required to comply with the ADA. And they can't impose safety requirements that are based on mere speculation, stereotypes, or generalizations rather than actual risks to safety. Um, same height and standard you have to show um, in the Fourth Circuit bad faith and gross misjudgment. And I went three minutes over, sorry, but the last little section real quick, I'm just gonna point out rights law. Um, I believe you guys got the link to that. You can um, search on here for different topics, say it's LRE, um, you can do a search and they'll come up. They have blog posts, they have articles written by lots of different attorneys and advocates and experts on all kinds of topics. The books are fantastic. I can't recommend them enough. Um, they also do trainings throughout the United States at various times. You can check on their website. In fact, this little example shows, but um, it's on their website where different trainings are. VDOE, the Virginia Department of Education, has lots of great guidance documents on their website. Um, so look there for different issues um, that you may be having to see if there's more guidance from VDOE. Uh, U.S. Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights, and the Office of Special Education Programs have lots of guidance documents on the website as well. Um, that are helpful, uh, particularly for Section 504. Um, note on here, I have students with ADHD in Section 504. They have a great guide for discipline under Section 504, so a lot of good stuff there, plus all the dear colleague letters. Um, there are certain special ed organizations that I can recommend. COPA is a national organization for parents, attorneys, uh, parents, parent attorneys, and advocates. Um, to, and they have an annual conference that I always call as College for Special Ed Attorneys, <laughs> um, but uh, I highly recommend that and resources on their site. There's a newer organization, National Allies for Parents in Special Education or NAPSI. Um, they have a Facebook page. They also offer a, a, an annual conference, although with COVID, I'm not sure what happened this year, but um, it's newer. It's, it was started by uh, some advocates here in Virginia, Sh um, Cheryl Poe, Amy Trail in Roanoke, um, probably some others, and then some other attorneys um, really help get that going. So that's a great organization and we should support because it started um, in our own backyard. Keatsy, um, that's the one here in Virginia. They have a lot of uh, resources and, um, there. Uh, Yellow Pages for Kids, if you're looking for a, a physical therapist or a speech therapist or a psychologist or an attorney or whatever you might need, um, there are resources there. And then also I'll put a plug in, William & Mary Law School, they have a special education advocacy clinic that parents can apply. It's um, it not always needs-based. As I recall, I think they had some flexibility on the, you know, depending on what the case was, but they will actually take cases um, and the law students actually work with um, experienced attorneys and, and help parents uh, with those cases. But as you can imagine, the number is few that they take, but that is a possibility. Um, they also put on every year a week-long Institute of Special Education Advocacy it's fantastic. Again, it's like college for special ed people, um, but it's a week long thing. You have to apply to go, but once you're an alumni, you get to come at, for discounted rates um, each year. They have a great network of their alumni. So um, put a plug in there too for people who are interested in this kind of advocacy. And that's my contact information. And uh, this time, you know, people need to go, go on. But if you wanna stay and ask questions, feel free. And guys, before anyone goes anywhere, I'm going to chat you a link. Um, I would love you to go ahead and fill out an evaluation of this training session before you go. Um, and also, I wanted to 
share with you. Let me let me go ahead and put that in the chat. And then y'all let me know if you have any trouble actually opening the, the evaluation form. Um, but while you're doing that, I also wanted to share with you a couple other resources. So like Melissa said, I mean, gosh, a big part of um, special ed is just knowing where your resources are and where to position your gaze and who to ask for questions. Um, since so much of our equipping is via social media these days, and that's how we consume so much information, I wanted to share with you um, a couple great pages to follow um, so that you can really be getting good info. Um, hang on one second. I have about a thousand screens open, tabs. So let me pull that up. And were y'all able to open the um, the evaluation okay? Okay, so. So do you guys see a screen on Facebook right now? No, oh, not yet. Now do you see a, a screen on Facebook? Yes, okay. So um, faces, and I wanna show you their picture because I can never remember their full name, but this is what their logo looks like. Um, they are an educational advocacy group out of Roanoke. Um, they are, uh, Amy Trail is on the board of NAPSI and she has a disabled son. So what I love about faces is every single day, a lot of times, multiple times of day, they post sample scripting of real life situations that may happen between parents and schools. And not only do they kind of play out, you know, what the school might say, but they also are telling you scripting of how to respond in that situation. Um, and I was also trying to find um, a lot of times they may go live with trainings and they used to have a ton of notes. Remember back when Facebook had notes, um, but for example, uh, one I totally mined it for um, a case of mine, their sample like letter to write to the school to request a comprehensive evaluation, stuff like that. So definitely add them to your list, give them a like and a follow. Um, another that I would suggest is advocating for kids, Cheryl Poe, she is also on the board of NAPSI. Also what I love, um, NAPSI this year, they featured especially black voices in advocacy and educational advocacy because a lot of times our our families of color are underserved and also under-resourced as far as there aren't many special ed attorneys at all, let alone special ed attorneys um, of color or advocates of color. Um, and also, you know, some assessment tools that we use are um, not always, they're kind of biased, um, racially biased. So again, her voice is so important. Um, She's doing all kinds of um, Facebook Lives for Black History Month, and I'm so excited about the one that's coming up, but advocating for kids. She's like in the Newport News or somewhere in that corner of the state. Um, trying to think if there are any others. Okay, I think those are some great ones to get you started. Um, but I wanted to show you those because, again, I'll, I'll try and tell you the group or the the names of the pages in the email that I send you, but it's so hard to like send Facebook links. So wanted you to see what they look like. Um, any other questions that someone wants to put in the chat specifically that you feel like everyone would benefit from? Um, if not, you are welcome. Oh, I think the 804 person, 804785, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question if you like. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, I'm calling on a landline, so I've listened to the entire uh, presentation, which was wonderful. How do I get my certificate? Because other, I looked back at everything, and we only listed our emails. Right. Do I yep. tell you now, or can I email you somehow to let you know that I listened to this? 
Um, oh, right. So you probably don't have capability to uh, put in the chat your email or name. Is that no, right? No, I'm not. I'm not able to do the chat. I'm talking to you on a landline. Old Perfect. school. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and tell me your name now and email address. And um, yep. Okay. I'll give you my email address. It's M-A-R-C-I-A-L-Y-N-E at AOL.com. Okay, and that was M A R C I A L I N E at AOL.com. And what name do you want to? No, M A R M A R C I A L Y N E at AOL.com. Okay. All right. And what name did you want on the certificate? M A R C I A L Y N, and the last name is E L L I S. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And anybody you. else who is calling on a phone, you can feel free to stay behind and give us that information as well. Anybody else have questions that they want to ask Melissa? Um, oh, Melissa, I had a question that I wanted to ask. Um, and again, I'll go ahead and ask it out loud because it may be general, general educate edification for the group. So another thing that I feel like we see a lot with our um, population of kids, um, especially kids in like middle and upper grades. So a lot of our kids sort of end of, in a way, end up being pushed out of the general ed classroom, whether that's through suspensions, expulsions, but also they get sent to um, residential placements or to the alternative school, right? And then a lot of times our kids may end up doing really well in the alternative school setting because a lot of times it's smaller classrooms, better staff to um, student ratios, more direct support. And I haven't well, actually, I think I did argue this one time unsuccessfully, but to me, that would seem to indicate, hey, look, we're already providing these accommodations. We probably need to codify that in the form of a 504 plan or an IEP. Right. And that, that's the to make is, you know, look at the evidence. You know, our big mantra in our law firm is data, 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 data. <laughs> Where's your data? If you want to say yes to something, where's your data? If you want to say no to something, where's your data? You want to change something, where's your data? And so, you know, having that data to show that the child was more successful, whether that's defined as better grades, or if it's defined as fewer uh, behavioral referrals, or if it's defined as, you know, better uh, social interactions, or if it's defined as better attendance. I mean, there's lots of, of uh, data points that can be brought into the discussion about what's different? How is this environment different from the other environment? And then what does the data show an improvement or deterioration um, from what was before? And so those are kind of the arguments that you want to make in um, why that, that uh, there needs to be an evaluation for I, uh, under IDEA, or if there needs to be evaluation for a 504 plan, or whatever the case may be, or if they already have those, why um, putting the child in a smaller in, um, educational environment should be part of the IEP um, because clear, <clears throat> clearly the child wasn't successful in the general education classroom. And remember, least restrictive environment is the one that's appropriate for that child. And being in the general education uh, classroom, <clears throat> sorry, my third so scratchy now, is, uh, is not appropriate for every child. Some need that smaller environment with fewer distractions uh, with more one-on-one uh, -on -one attention to be able to be successful, whether it's behaviorally, academically, socially, whatever the case may be. Yeah, and I feel like also for some of those kids, the other thing that I end up seeing a lot of times is they get sort of siloed, exiled off into the GED program rather than, okay, do we need to look at supports, robust supports and accommodations to actually help them get to the academic goals? Well, and this case right now, I was just talking to my mom today, but um, it, you know, it's these kids get so beat down over so many years and now they're juniors or seniors in high school and they just don't see a positive pathway for them. 
you know, they've been expelled or they've gotten bad grades or they've been bullied mercilessly or, you know, whatever the case may be. And, you know, one teacher or administrator says, well, you know, you could get a GED and you wouldn't have to do this anymore. And now the seed is planted, the bush has grown, the sticker bush in my mind, um, you know, and instead of trying to address the problems and fix it so the child can actually have a positive educational experience, now we're essentially, you know, kicking them out with a, a GED. And usually they don't even explain to the kids what's involved in the GED process. It's not like you sign up one day, take a test and you're done and you're out. I mean, there's a whole process involved in this and the test is much harder now than it was maybe was it five, six years ago, they changed that. So um, yes, unfortunately those seeds get planted by the school districts and it's very frustrating because when you're talking about a 17 or 18 year old kid, um, even a 16 year old kid, if they are not bought into the process, then there's no sense in us wasting our time, breath or effort because we can come up with the most perfect IEP, the best placement you know, on the face of the planet, but if that kid isn't bought in, we all just wasted our time. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, good. Any other questions? I don't wanna monopolize 